Have you ever heard of an aura? Sometimes people who get migraines experience auras before their migraine hits. An aura is a general term that means the perception of some sort of it's a perceptual disturbance that's experienced by people typically before they have a migraine or if they're epileptic before they have a seizure. Um, it's not necessarily visual. I've given two visual examples here, but it could be auditory. It could be smell based. Um, currently, researchers believe that auras are produced by some sort of unusual pattern of electrical stimulation in the brain that occurs right before a migraine or a seizure. Um, it's a kind of top-down processing in the sense that um, what you're seeing is not something that's out there in the physical world. It's something that's generated entirely in your brain. Um, but it's really a wild, it's, it's like an extreme version of top-down processing. Okay, I just wanted to mention that because uh, people who have migraines always wonder about auras. Uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about language perception. I'm going to start by talking about verbal language and then we'll expand it to sign language. Um, in verbal language, there the building blocks of verbal language are phonemes, sounds. Um, uh, so you, you, you take these little bricks, these sounds, and you combine them to form words, right? So ah, ba, t, p, those are phonemes. Um, now there's a problem of um, invariance. And all that means is the way I say b, p, t varies from the way you say it. Um, the way I say it now is probably different from the way I said it this morning. Um, so how do we ever identify the sounds that people are producing if everybody produces individual sounds a little differently. Now, what do I mean by differently? Well, down on the bottom of this graph is something called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram it gives you uh, the frequency of energy that comes out of the mouth um, as you're saying things. So um, what I want you to notice from this spectrogram, and this is a spectrogram of someone saying, I owe you I owe you a yo-yo. I owe you a yo-yo. Um, what I want you to see is we assume that when we pronounce words that there's like a gap or non-energy coming out between words. We don't think the words just, the words in a sentence are just all streamed together. It's an illusion that we think that there are gaps between words. And it's an illusion you would have understood anytime you listen to someone speaking a language you don't know. When people speak languages you don't know, it sounds like one big continuous stream with occasional gaps. But in terms of words in a sentence or sounds in a word, it's just one continuous stream. That you're hearing accurately. But when you're hearing someone speak your own language, your perception that there are pauses between the words, that's the illusion. Um, anyway. The sounds that you hear people speak depend on the sounds that they made previously and will make in the, um, uh, in the immediate future. Um, now, there's also gaps in our perception of phonemes. So you can think of the blind spot as creating a gap in our visual perception of the world that our brain has to fill in, but there's also gaps in the auditory world. So for example, if um, I'm talking and there's a noise in the background, um, that noise is kind of occluding or masking some of the sounds that I'm making. And yet you can hear people, you can hear what people are saying in a crowded area. Maybe, you know, back before COVID, hanging out in a bar with friends, it could be very noisy. Um, and you can still hear people speaking um, and what they're saying. And that ability is called the phonemic restoration effect. And we're going to do a demonstration of that here. 
In three clips, I'd like to show you the phonemic restoration effect. In the first clip, there are periods of silence in which phonemes have been effectively removed. In the second clip, the periods of silence have instead been replaced by noise. The noise creates the perception that you'll hear the phonemes even though they're not really there. In the final clip, you'll hear the speech as it originally was. Here it goes. I loved my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. I loved my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. I love to teach my students. This is an example of the phonemic restoration effect. Okay. So your brain is using top-down information to fill in or to make its best guess about the sounds or words that other people were saying when they're missing. Turns out the same phenomenon occurs in sign language. They have to, um, well, they do interpret signs in terms of their knowledge of sign language and what the signer intends. So even when people use inappropriate signs, a signer can understand what the intention was. So let's watch that. Cool. Here's another example of your brain filling in language. This is going to be a, a verbal auditory example again. You see here four sentences that are identical except for the last word, right? The last word could be axle, shoe, orange, or table. If you play this, um, these sentences to subjects and ask them what sound did they hear where the asterisk is? And that asterisk, you've taken the information out, right? What was that word that you heard? Uh, when the end of the sentence is axle, they'll have heard wheel. If it's the end of the sentence is shoe, then they will interpret that eel as heel. Uh, if the last word was orange, the eel is perceived to be peel, etc. Your brain is using information, this time retroactively, right? Because the word doesn't come until after the missing sound. And yet our brain goes backwards and fills that in. Top-down processing in the auditory system. Okay, that's it for this segment. Come right back and we'll talk about the roles of nature and nurture in shaping our perception of the world.